Welcome everyone. This is Libby Mucciaroni, Member Engagement and Education Manager at the Organic Trade Association. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on the environmental benefits of organic cotton. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin our presentation today. This webinar is being recorded. In the next 48 hours, all registrants will receive a follow-up email, which will include all of the PDF slides from today's presentation, handouts, and helpful links that we share throughout the webinar, and a registration link to view today's recording. Included in the platform are three handouts. You'll find one from the Organic uh, Trade from the uh, Organic Center, excuse me, um, their companion document on the study that Dr. Dellett did with the Organic Center. As well, you'll find some handouts about um, our organic cotton study social toolkit. Uh, and in addition, you'll find our best labeling practices for textiles document. During registration, we ask that you let our presenters know any questions that you had about today's topic. With over 300 registrants, we are so thankful for such an interested and diverse and engaged audience. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter them in the questions pane on the platform. Our presenters will respond to your question at, as time permits in the last uh, portion of our webinar today. And finally, if you happen to have any technical issues during the presentation, please notify us through the questions pane or you can email me directly. The Organic Trade Association is a membership-based organization for the organic industry. We ensure that all parts of the organic value chain have a strong voice in government and in our communities. We bring farmers, processors, distributors, retailers, and others together to promote and protect the growing organic sector. OTA represents its members to government on sector needs, market development and promotion, and strong organic standards and regulations. Members also receive the latest information and quick answers on organic regulations and standards in the United States and around the world. The Organic Center is a nonprofit research and education organization based out of Washington, D.C. They work to conduct and convene credible and evidence-based science on the environmental and health effects of organic food and farming and communicate the findings to the public. The Organic Center's work is supported by companies and individuals who desire a sustainable and secure food system that promotes the health of humans and the environment. We're thrilled to be joined by a dynamic group of panelists for today's webinar. Dr. Kathleen Dellett, professor at Iowa State University in a joint position between the Departments of Horticulture and Agronomy, where she is responsible for research extension and teaching in organic agriculture. She was awarded the first faculty position in organic agriculture at a land grant university in the United States in 1997. She's farmed organically in Iowa, California, Florida, and Hawaii, and has presented and was presented with the Organic Pioneer Award from Rodale Institute in 2017. Dr. Dellett is joined by Angela Wortis Call. Angela serves as the vice chair of the Organic Trade Association's Fiber Council and works as an organic inspector and consultant with independent organic services and is the co founder of Fiber Evolution, promoting revitalization of fiber flax in the Pacific Northwest. And finally, today's webinar is moderated and presented by Dr. Jessica Shade of the Organic Center, who leads the center as the director of science programs. And with that, I'd like to hand the reins over to Jessica for today's presentation and thank you all for joining us. All right, thank you so much, Libby. Um, hi everyone, as Libby mentioned, I am Jessica Shade, the Director of Science Programs for the Organic Center. And we are thrilled to be sharing this organic cotton webinar with you about the latest research that we're rolling out with Dr. Dellett at Iowa State University and the Organic Trade Association's Fiber Council. So I'm gonna give a little background on organic cotton to contextualize the importance of our research findings um, on the environmental benefits of organic cotton. Then Dr. Dalit's gonna talk directly about the research and Angela um, is going to share some context and information about organic cotton through the supply chain. So if we go to um, the first slide, I think that we're already there actually. So the first thing that I want to point out is how important it is to think beyond food when it comes to organic. 
because people don't always consider that when it comes to the clothes we wear, um, to um, the sheets we sleep on, to the personal care items that we depend on, um, the mattresses in our bedrooms, that that also plays a critical part into choosing organic. Um, especially because organic is one of the most important choices that people can make for the environment. It's a huge commodity, one of the most widely grown crops around the world, and conventional cotton is one of the most chemically intensive crops with really serious consequences for our air, water, soil, and climate, not to mention the health of farm workers on, and cotton processors. So um, Angela's gonna talk a little bit more about what organic means when it comes to cotton, but the short of it is that organic cotton is grown, processed, dyed, and finished with methods that have a focus on building ecosystem health and reducing the use of toxic pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, and hazardous processing chemicals. And people are starting to pay attention to that difference. You can see it reflected in the growth of organic cotton over the last few years. The market's been growing by 12% annually, and it's the largest and fastest growing non-food part of the organic sector. Um, in 2019, it had $2 billion worth of sales. So if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about one of the big reasons that it's especially important to think organic for cotton, um, which is that conventional cotton is notorious for being one of the world's most chemically intensive crops. It uses over 68 million pounds of pesticide, and it's the third largest pesticide user in the US behind corn and soybeans. And a lot of the pesticides that it uses have been directly linked to harmful environmental impacts. So insecticides like organophosphates, um, pyrethroids, neonicotinoids. And when it comes to herbicides, glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is a huge proportion of the pesticide load and makes up more than a third of all pesticides used in cotton. And however worrisome glyphosate is on its own, there's also a growing list of even more hazardous herbicides that are being used increasingly frequently in response to glyphosate-resistant superweeds. And we're probably going to see the use of herbicides continue to grow because new GMO cotton varieties are resistant to a cocktail of herbicides like glyphosate, um, glufosinate, and dicamba, or glyphosate, glufosinate, and 2,4-D. Um, and dicamba and 2,4-D are especially concerning because they have higher toxicity levels than glyphosate and they're more susceptible to drift, which increases the risk of contamination to nearby crops as well as human exposure. Um, and that onslaught of chemical use doesn't stop at the farm gate for conventional textiles. There are a wide variety of hazardous inputs that are used in conventional processing for cotton as well. Things like ammonia, heavy metal-based dyes, flame retardants, formaldehyde, um, softeners, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So the good news is that all those chemicals are banned from use in the producing and processing of organic cotton. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about the environmental benefits of organic production. Um, and Dr. Dellid is gonna talk about some of the specifics from our research study, but I'll just place those findings in the context of other research um, that's been done that our work builds off of. So I'll start with climate change because organic cotton outperforms conventional when it comes to climate change mitigation. The textile exchange did a life cycle analysis for organic cotton and found that energy demand, um, when it's calculated on a per yield basis, was 62% lower than that of conventional cotton. And that they also found that the total global warming potential of organic cotton was 46% lower than that of conventional cotton. 
And other studies have found similar findings that organic production methods significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and use less energy, even outside of cotton production. There's this growing body of research that point to organic farming techniques as a way to build soil carbon while reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving energy efficiency. So things like fallowing, which allows organic matter to accumulate and decompose and restore nutrients to the soil, um, the use of crop rotations, using manure and legumes for fertilizer, which is especially important because using alternatives replaces synthetic fertilizers, which is a major agricultural contributor to greenhouse gas production and energy use. And they also put organic matter back into the soil. So it's this double benefit. And then there's the prohibition of most synthetic pesticides, which are really energy intensive to create. So if we go to the next slide, um, one of the things that I hear a lot is that there's so much variation in techniques that are used within conventional and organic management that you can't make a generalization on one system or another. But we actually looked at this. So we took all that variation into account. Um, and this study wasn't cotton specific. But we collaborated with the National Soil Project at Northeastern University to take this huge snapshot of exactly what's going on in organic and conventional soils from around the United States to really see the real world implications of all the management styles within organic and conventional agriculture and what they're having on soil carbon sequestration. And what we found was that even with all of the differences within organic and conventional with all the noise and different strategies on different soils, organic still had dramatically higher levels of long-term carbon storage reserves. And what's cool about our study is that we didn't just look at the total carbon in soils, we were also able to look at the different parts of that carbon so we could see the carbon that fluctuates from year to year and then the truly sequestered carbon that's locked away in reserves that won't be released for decades or even centuries. So let's move on to, organ to water on the next slide. Um, organic cotton produce it production can significantly reduce the amount of water pollution via soil erosion and nutrient leaching compared to conventional cotton production. And those benefits have also been documented in other cropping systems where organically managed soils retain water and nutrients more effectively than conventionally managed soils. And because of the soil health benefits that organic systems provide, organic soils are also better able to hold water, which can reduce the need for irrigation. And it's really difficult to document the actual water savings without intric intricate, expensive water monitoring equipment. But the Textile Exchange did this project modeling potential water savings and found that in the entire cycle of production and processing, organic can reduce water consumption by as much as 91%, which is pretty cool. So on the next slide, we'll look at biodiversity because this is one that often gets overlooked, but it's also one of the most research supported areas of organic. And I've seen studies showing that organic supports more biodiversity for pollinators like honeybees and native pollinators, um, for beneficial predators like beetles, spiders, parasitoids, for soil organisms like earthworms, microbes, and fungi, um, and for a multitude of other organisms like plants, birds, et cetera. So there's so many studies out there looking at the benefits of organic when it comes to biodiversity. There are even studies showing that organic farms can help their nearby conventional neighbors because biodiversity increases don't stop at the organic farm boundary, they actually have positive impacts on the biodiversity levels of nearby conventional farms. So I'll go ahead and pass it on to Professor Kathleen Dellett, who will give some more details about um, the latest research that we're rolling out. So Kathleen, you can jump on. Thank you, Dr. Jade. And thank you everyone for joining. Be sharing my screen now. Does that, Libby, if you can give me an okay on that one? 
see my screen? Yep, you're perfect. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for inviting me, OTA and OC, to this important webinar about the value of organic cotton. And um, we conducted a survey of organic producers and handlers in 2019. So I'm going to be presenting results of that survey. I'd like to thank Organic Center for sponsoring it. I'd like to thank all the farmers and handlers who responded to the survey and gave us some such great information. So you may be asking what's someone in Iowa, what's someone that works with organic grain? Talking, why are, am I talking about organic cotton? Well, I'm from Florida, in Florida, they do grow cotton in Florida, and I actually have deep connections to the town of Apalachicola, Florida, which is near the Red Hills uh, cotton growing region of Southern Georgia and Northern Florida. And the town of Apalachicola is actually, was actually a major port for cotton in the 1800s. And you can see some of the remaining uh, buildings from the 1800s. This is a French consulate that was involved with the um, cotton trade at the time. The historical site has a lot of photos like this of steamboats uh, taking cotton up and down the Apalachicola River. And the Chapman Botanical Gardens there in Apalachicola still retains a cotton collection today. So with that background, I'm going to talk to you about cotton. And Jessica did a good job of presenting the issues related to conventional cotton because I think it's important to look at that as a comparison. Um, the problems with health problems related to pesticides, resistance now among cotton pests due to continuous pesticide application, elimination of natural enemies. Production costs are high, especially for synthetic uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And now um, also we have resistance to BT cotton. This is a study from Feeble that I think you have access to on your on the website. So um, in our paper, we showed the increase in glyphosate use, for example, in conventional cotton in the US. This is uh, millions of hectares here compared to millions of acres treated with glyphosate. And the other issue with herbicide is herbicide resistance. And this slide shows the increase in the number of herbicide resistant weeds worldwide. And I'm sure this has increased. So um, the issue with conventional no-till is that it requires this synthetic herbicide and also transgenic seed, both of which are disallowed in organic production. I'd like to thank Kelly Pepper and there's Lorea Pepper here too, Textile Exchange for all their help with this uh, survey. Uh, did some interviews with Kelly after we conducted the survey, appreciate all his information. So, um, Organic cotton, as Jessica mentioned, has no toxic persistent pesticides, no synthetic fertilizers, no sewage sludge, or genetically modified organisms. There's no fumigants used in organic cotton. And the problem with getting cotton, trying to get organic cotton from overseas, is all foreign cotton must be fumigated upon entry to the United States. So it will lose its organic status if it's imported to the United States in its raw form. Defoliants to knock the leaves off before the harvest of the cotton bowls. Their farmers use natural methods. They use a freeze and dry downs. They hold the irrigation just to, um, to help release the leaves. And um, other, there's other approved methods in organic, but the farmers felt those weren't as effective. Could be another area of research. And finally, what's required are methods to build soil health and support biodiversity, as Jessica mentioned. So the organic approach that organic farmers take around the world is that they view the farm as a system with multiple tritrophic interactions, meaning that there's multiple, multiple plant, pest, natural enemy interactions to help create a balance and buffer against perturbations. The USDA NOP, National Organic Program, does require soil quality maintenance to ensure healthy plants. Prevention of problems is the first line of defense on organic farms. That's why resistant varieties, for example, are so important on organic farms. And when controls are warranted, the least toxic materials should be utilized to avoid, avoid any harm to beneficial insects and pollinators. So this is a snapshot of our um, survey list. We, had, we got our list from the USDA National Organic Integrity Database in 2019. And you can see uh, where we sent out the survey majority of producers and handlers are in the state of Texas. So we'll be focusing a little bit on 
Texas here, the slides from Kelly, um, talking about the Texas Organic Cotton Marketing Co-op, which was founded in 1993 by pioneers in the development of organic cotton production in the United States. There's currently about 35 members. In 2020, they planted 16,000 acres of organic and transitional cotton, and that still wasn't enough to meet the demand for organic cotton. So that came out loud and clear in the survey, and I'll be talking about that in a minute here. They're headquartered in Lubbock, Texas, which I think had six inches of snow this week. So um, interesting times. I'm not gonna go through this. This is a list of all the organic cotton practices compared to conventional cotton practices that's uh, available on that link, or I believe Libby's loaded the publication too, put out by the Organic Center. But I'm just gonna just point out one at the top here. So for a nutrient management practice on conventional cotton farms, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is used. What are the problems with that? Can lead to acidification of soils and can have a detrimental effect on beneficial soil biota. Now let's compare to organic cotton farms. They use cover crops. This came out in the survey. Cereal rye, crimson clover, there was a host of cover crops. These were the most predominant. They also used radishes and vetch, for example. So in addition to adding fertility for the cotton crop, they're also building carbon in the soil through this practice. One thing that came out loud and clear in the survey was the importance of climate change, as Jessica mentioned. So organic cotton farmers are really having a tough time mitigating or dealing with climate change. There's more drought, there's more heat um, across the planet. This is a map from Dennis Toddy here at the Midwest Climate Hub in Ames, Iowa. And anything that's orange or darker is a half a degree all the way up to 1.5 degrees warmer temperatures observed over the last uh, couple of years. So what can you do to mitigate that? What came out in the survey is some folks, very few though, are using irrigation. Um, drip irrigation is expensive. And so the returns would need to uh, justify the use of drip irrigation. So if there's more support for um, organic cotton, possibly there could be more drip irrigation used in the sector. But as Jessica mentioned, organic farmers have to maintain high soil quality and that will help increase soil carbon, increase organic matter in the soil, and that in turn increases that soil water holding capacity. It'll increase nutrient cycling and lead to less runoff of water. Now we don't have cotton specific research on this and that would be really great if uh, USDA and private sector could support organic cotton research similar to, we've done a lot of organic grain crop research here at Iowa State working with um, the late Cindy Cambridella shown here at USDA Ag Research Service in Ames, showing that soil quality was greater in organic, this is our long-term organic site, even with tillage. So just like cotton farmers, our primary, primary method of using, uh, for weed management is using mechanical uh, tillage. So even with tillage, Cindy showed higher carbon and nitrogen in the organic system, higher biologically active carbon and nitrogen, these factors here, and also higher microbial biomass in the organic compared to the conventional. And this, was, this is what really drives the system is having these higher beneficial microbial populations in the organic system. And Matt Baker at the USDA also, uh, we worked with him where he studied the microbial community analysis, compare it in conventional versus organic. And he found some interesting differences between organic and conventional, including the uh, functional genes that are responsible for the production and consumption of greenhouse gas gases. So if you're interested in that work, there's a citation there. Also working with Cindy and USDA, um, we, shown, we have shown through our organic water quality site that organic practices can lower nitrate leaching compared to conventional production. Each plot in this study was underlaid with tiles that led into these sumps. And in these sumps, the water samples were collected and we monitored nitrates and other things. And what we found was that the tile water nitrogen loading loss from the organic system with corn, soybean, oat, alfalfa, alfalfa, four-year rotation was 53% lower 
than the conventional corn soybean system, leading us to conclude that diversifying monocultures with perennials or small grains can enhance the ecosystem service of enhanced nutrient cycling. Also worked with a student here at Iowa State, Arian Singerman, and looked at um, greenhouse gas production. And he found that greenhouse gases were lower in organic, this, this is organic soybean, 19% lower um, CO2 equivalent emissions than conventional growers even conventional growers that are using no-till, there were there were lower greenhouse gases in the organic system compared to the conventional. So soil carbon enhancement sequestration, Jessica touched on this. It's very important. It's a big concern. It came out as a big concern uh, among surveyed farmers. And as Jessica mentioned, there's multiple factors associated with that increased soil quality under organic conditions, including crop rotations and cover crops. This was a great study done by Marshall McDaniel here at Iowa State, looking at how much more additional carbon is added to the system just by adding additional crops to your rotation and adding a cover crop like red clover. Um, so I invite you to check out that study. Also, Jessica mentioned the importance of manure and compost amendments to add carbon to the soil. To the soil. And by not using synthetic fertilizers and herbicides, you're also helping increase your microbial populations and carbon sequestration. So the farmers in the survey wanted to know about reward payments for carbon inputs. And we do have some green payments from the government through NRCS Conservation Security Program, EQIP programs. Those are all great. We need a lot more of them. But there's also now private companies um, that are looking into carbon trading, carbon markets, and Kelly Pepper sent this one that they're working with, um, soilcarbon.co, I invite you to check that out too. What about cotton pests? Yes, there are insects out there as there are in most organic systems, but they weren't, they didn't come out as being as, as big a concern as weeds, which I'll talk about in a minute. So yes, um, organic cotton farmers do have bollworm, aphids, thrips, boll weevil, and to a lesser extent, stink bug, army worms and root knot nematode. Well, what are they doing about that? They are using biological control. They're using natural controls. 40% of surveyed farmers uh, reported increased beneficials on their farms. They're conserving area for the beneficials. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're also using trap crops like okra shown here, trap crop for bollworm and sunflowers. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that area can either be treated uh, with a organic compliant insecticide, or it could be plowed under, cut and plowed under that trap crop area. They're also, they also cited releasing beneficial insects, um, such as these parasitic wasps shown here and lady beetles. And one uh, farmer said that he was actually using entomopathogens, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, so a brand name for that would be Dipel, for example, and Steiner Nema against um, nematodes. There's also a naturally occurring biological control going on out there. Like this is a naturally occurring entomopathogen fungus that gets on aphids called Pandora. So if you see those fuzzy pink aphids out there, you know that you have a high level of biocontrol on your farm. What about GMO contamination and pesticide drift? Yes, that was mentioned. As a matter of fact, the organic farmers survey considered the GMO prevalence in conventional cotton a major problem for organic where up to 30% of the seed may be contaminated. And because of this and other issues, untreated non-GMO seed can be used in organic due to the unavailability of organic seed. That's not the case in organic grain production here in the Midwest. We have enough organic seed, thankfully, that um, we, everyone is able to source organic grain seed, but it's not the case with cotton. So something needs to be done about that. And fortunately, there are people working on that. Dr. Jane Deaver at Texas A&M, she has an organic cotton breeding program among other um, breeding programs for cotton. And she's um, been working on organic varieties. They're not released yet, but we're hopeful they'll be out soon. And we thank USDA and Texas A&M for supporting this important research. Weed management, I mentioned, was cited as the number one issue for organic cotton producers. 60% cited it as their number one issue. 
They use, as I mentioned, mechanical controls, the same as we do in organic grain production, rotary hose, row cultivators. They're interested in alternatives as we are here, what we're looking at here. Um, robotic weeders was one that was mentioned. We have a prototype here in ISU and Lai Tang's lab, but there also are some robotic weeders available commercially. They're very, very expensive though. So I think it'll be a while before they'll be around. Um, we're looking at organic no-till. That could be a potential for organic cotton production. It's very management intensive where you're planting the cover crop, you're rolling it, and then you're putting your seed right behind there. Um, so we, we're still working on that here, trying to perfect that for grain, but that is a potential that cotton growers would like someone to research for them. So finally ending up, um, one thing that came out loud and clear through the survey was that demand is much higher than supply. And I think the pandemic did alert consumers to the need for supporting more local and domestic food and fiber supply. Just in March, 2020 alone, organic produce sales were up 22% over the previous year. And as you already heard from Jessica, fiber sales were up 12% in 2019. Just a shout out to Spirit Techs here using organic cotton in their face masks and bandanas, and they're using domestic supplies of organic cotton. So the future of US organic cotton, what I found from the survey is the farmers would like a solid commitment from the organic industry to support US organic cotton production. And that will help buffer against that variability we're seeing due to weather. Kelly sent this chart of just the immense variability in cotton production due to weather. For example, in 2020, I mentioned even with a great amount of production they had, they it was still <clears throat> half of what they could normally get because of the drought. They also had high winds and hail. So weather is a, a big factor in organic cotton production. Some farmers mentioned about the potential of a transitional label. So in the two years prior to certification, um, where farmers are using organic practices, but they're not certified yet, could they uh, possibly increase supply by having transitional cotton in that in the supply chain. And I know Patagonia does mention on their website about their in-conversion um, cotton. So um, be interested in hearing from the industry about that. There's my contact info. I can give you a lot more information on organic grains, but it was uh, wonderful to work with Jessica and Angela on this project because I do have a deep passion for cotton clothing, organic cotton clothing, and um, be happy to take any questions. So back to you, Jessica. All right, great. And I think we are going to pass it on to Angela, and then we will do questions after we hear from her. Hi, everybody. Libby's going to do my slides for me. <laughs> Um, I wanted to start off with uh, thanking you all for joining us today. Thanks to Jessica and Kathleen for helping out with this amazing report and uh, spearheading um, all of our efforts in this collaborative moment to try and bring forth some very good and, um, and well-researched and current data about organic cotton production in the U.S. So I'll be discussing the Fiber Council's work to promote organic fibers in the textile supply chain, specifically organic cotton. But first wanted to highlight the expansive growth of this sector so we see the impact of using organic fibers on our health and the health of workers in the supply chain uh, that are producing the clothes and bedding that we're all enjoying. So here we've got our mission where we are absolutely mission aligned with industry. Um, founded in 2015, our uh, mission supports the industry the needs of our membership. We have grown to over 40 members across the fiber sectors and categories and focus on the benefits of organic certification for textiles. Our goal is to grow the organic fiber sector uh, overall. And cotton is the most used natural fiber in the textile industry. So organic cotton is the base for most of the organic textile brand that we're working from. So we're, we all have a hand in it and uh, some more than others. Next slide, please. This is our current membership. It's quite a fabulous crew, I might say. 
um, from field to finished product. We represent all steps in the supply chain. Uh, I'd like to show some appreciation to the members that contributed funds to the organic study. Um, Control Union, Koyuchi, Metaware, Good Earth, Jimmy Weedle Farms, Linda Cabot Design, Nature Pedic, OneCert, uh, Organ Tilth, um, Texas Organic Cotton Marketing Co-op, Textile Exchange, Timberland, and Wearpack. And thank you all for your contribution to this collaborative effort. So you can see we have uh, quite a, an incredible crew here and we're uh, growing every year with uh, more members. Next slide, please. And we're here to stay. So $2.2 billion industry and it, we deserve some clear messaging about the use of organic fiber. And it has um, been our, our goal since the beginning to make sure that we're very action oriented. So in late 2018, the Fiber Council raised 12,000 to support the research project that, uh, that you've just heard about. And um, we, have a, we had a broad array of research available throughout the sector that I could say was pretty much outdated. So in some of those situations where you'd go to websites of, of um, maybe your favorite t-shirt and, and want to buy one because it was organic, there would be all kinds of stats there, uh, placing uh, a huge amount of credit to organic cotton, uh, saving water of uh, you know numerous liters per t-shirt or how much energy it would save to grow organically. But yet none of it was necessarily referenceable or citable. And it made it so that consumers would see a huge array of facts that maybe they didn't have any any way of uh, fact checking, and it just showed that that across the board we had all these different ideas of uh, the benefits of organic cotton and organic fibers in general. And we felt like we really needed to hone in on a clear message and get current data. And that was the the impetus for uh, asking Kathleen and Jessica to participate in and pull it all together in a collaborative effort to put this report together. So we represent a huge sector of organics right now and we're growing considerably like 12 percent every year so we definitely wanted to have some clear messaging out there because a lot of consumers are buying organic textiles next slide please we have a work plan every year that propels uh, our objectives forward in a pretty aggressive way. Um, we're always updating the fact sheets and best practices guides to make sure that we capture the market trends so that all of our members and the general public can use that information when communicating to their consumer base. And then we do four quarterly calls uh, where we have all our membership together to talk about the most current uh, issues happening in certification and organic textile production. Um, our membership includes the, um, the Global Organic Textile Standard North American uh, representative, Lori Wyman. And then we have Textile Exchange there as well with Lee Tyler. And then we also um, move forward with, uh, since, or, since the organic Trade Association is a stakeholder in the Global Organic Textile Standard. We get very up-to-date information about what's happening um, with the development of the standard and changes and revisions. And so we all have a hand in, um, in making it a stronger and, uh, and better certification world for organic textiles in general. So it's, it's quite impressive. Next slide, please. This is, this is where we're at. So we've got, you can see from the entire infographic that food and fiber mesh all across the board in every aspect of our lives. And it's a positive impact for organic fibers in, uh, from the farm all the way to the finished product. Even at the factory level, as you can see on that third line, this is, this is where we exist most often because we're raw materials are coming into our supply chain that are need to already be certified organic. And then once it hits the first processing step, then that's where the certifications for GOTS and the organic content standard take over. And this is where we're most, most involved in, uh, in the supply chain and see the most impact of using organic fibers throughout there with the health of the workers that are making those products, even from bedding to hygiene to the clothes that we're wearing right now, all the way through the lack of, uh, of heavy metals that are in the dyes that are being used, the, the worker safety and requirements uh, on the floor to make sure that everybody is safe while using any of those products, the review of chemical inputs, every part of it has some 
<laughs> I would say, like intense uh, scrutiny that in the supply chain that we all try to adhere to and then to be able to be certified. And so then we can actually take this forward into the health of the people that are actually buying those products. So we can assure through the traceability of the supply chain that when you're laying your little child down in the crib, that it's not gonna have an impact on their health through those those natural fibers that they're laying on and we can't make that guarantee for all fibers out there that are being used so we want to have the most healthy homes that we possibly can and i think the best way to do that is through the organic supply chain next slide please here you can see the consumers are taking their knowledge of organic practices from the food sector and applying those expectations and oversight and traceability to organic clothes and home goods that they're buying right now. And they're asking for it. They're asking for more and more sustainable brands and they're asking for more and more uh, organic fibers and, and products out in the, in the market so that they can take advantage of it. And it, it is like consistent all the time, constant news every day coming in that consumers are asking for more sustainable goods. And so we're seeing a huge amount of uh, increase in sales, as you can see in those last class slides, but also that, you know, from the studies that, that are happening all over uh, the planet from Dutch to the OTA Grow Initiative to um, different university studies, uh, looking at consumers' needs uh, for sustainable um, products. And even in, in COVID times, we're seeing that people are buying less and they're buying higher quality and they're buying with a mind toward sustainable brands and that's that's been an amazing push in this last year so i think that um, we're only going to see more growth in this sector for sure the fiber council also contributed to the organic trade association's grow initiative so we could be a part of the collaborative effort to promote food and fiber systems um, through their projects and we take this messaging to textile uh, conferences to promote the use of organic materials like in October of 2020 uh, five of our five of our fiber council membership organizations collaborated in hosting the organic fiber alley at the shift con eco wellness influencer conference and that was Koyuchi Delilah home eco fashion corp uh, gallant international and naturopedic and they all came together together to celebrate the integrity of organic brands with influencers and and these are the people that are that are telling consumers to go out and buy, you know, more organic clothing and more organic bedding. Like they're they're having a huge impact on what the consumer base uh, desires, and we need to be able to reach them and and show that we have uh, solid backing and traceability, and um, and that these products are really organic when they're coming to those consumers. So. We're not stopping at organic raw materials. The future focus will also include end of life for textile goods. And many companies are investigating recycling programs, upcycling, reuse, repair, secondhand clothing sales, um, diversion from the landfills, <laughs> essentially. And our own member, uh, Donna, is pushing forward for a zero waste uh, business model. So we're taking it even further, not just stopping at the organic uh, fiber use, but talking about what's gonna happen later. Can I have the next slide, please? This data is for you. This data is for you, organic brands and organic consumers to use and to show and share about what is the most current and fact-checked information about the benefits of organic cotton in the entire supply chain. So please use it, please share it. Please uh, send it to your entire company staff in a broad email today. Please make sure that your marketing team knows that these facts are out there and that they've uh, just been released and you could update websites and uh, frequently asked questions, you know, uh, product descriptions, all kinds of stuff that we see out there in the digital world that, um, that promotes organic cotton. Now start using a consistent and um, citable uh, publication to be able to promote this fiber. So it was meant for you, it's public, it's open to the public use and please use that toolkit that, that Kelly from OTA has created and uh, Libby dropped into our chat box. Um, we are here to support uh, the benefit of organic fibers across the board and we really want everybody to, uh, to take advantage of the resources that we've tried to collect for everyone. And uh, thank you so much. And if uh, anybody has 
any questions uh, later, we'll address them in the, the Q&A. And there's my contact information. Drop me a line. I love hard questions, difficult questions, strange questions about organic fibers. <laughs> Awesome, thank you so much. And Kathleen, if you join us as well, we'll take questions from everyone now. We've already been getting a lot kind of racking up in the questions list. So first of all, there were for some clarifying questions. Um, some people were asking for citations so they could read the studies we were referencing. If you want any of those um, on the um, attachments or on our website, you can download um, the companion report that we wrote to go with the scientific paper. And in that, basically everything that I said is in that with links to the original study. So any, any stats that I mentioned, you can click links within that report and go read the original study if you're interested in that. Um, there was also a question for Kathleen. Can you clarify the status of the use of non-organic seeds? So specifically, you stated that seed is 30% GMO contaminated. Does that mean that 30% of the samples tested positive for GMOs or that the average level of contamination across all samples was 30%? And is there an acceptable threshold for GMO contamination for planting non-organic seed in certified organic fields? Thank you, Jessica. Again, I can only report what was written on the survey. Um, we could follow up with Kelly Pepper if he's willing to talk, um, if he's online. Um, what I deduced from that statement was, yes, there was, um, I would say, up to 30% contamination. And um, of course, those seeds would not be used because you're, you have to have your seed tested. If it's contaminated, you can't use it. So because of that, because of issues of the lack of organic seed, non-treated, non-GMO cotton can be used right now as an exemption in organic cotton production. Right, so it's an issue for organic farmers who are using that conventional seed, but then if that conventional seed tests positive for GMOs, they still can't use it. So that burden is on the organic farmer. Angela, do you have anything to add to that from your experience? It's an incredibly complex issue because it, it takes into account what um, where the test is taken. You know, so it could be at the foundation seed level, could be at the grow out seed level, it could be in the field, it could be a pedal test. There's always some variation about where the test is being taken and then what kind of test is used. So if it's a strip test that um, basically captures maybe five or six of, of the, the GMO um, precursors that there's 23 right now for GMO cotton, but maybe they only, the strip tests only do five or six at a time. So maybe the grower is only doing one or two of those strip tests. And so they're only seeing maybe a fraction of what the possible contamination could be. But where we're seeing the, the concentration of contamination is gonna be at the foundation seed level. And then, then the, it's on the burden of the farmer, or the farmer's burden, to make sure that they're following their organic system plan when they're planting that out in their field. And if there's advantageous contamination coming in, they, that's not controllable. So we do see this background contamination level of maybe two to 3%, maybe 4%, depending on what region organic cotton is being grown in and what time of year and, and wind and weather and everything about it has, you know, it's, it's, there's so many different aspects that go in. So just to be able to say like, we can't plant that seed because it has contamination level, it, it's on the certifier to really understand what the situation was. And we're not seeing a lot of seed out there with 0%. That's that's like a thing of the past. <laughs> that was like 50 years ago. We're not seeing that anymore. So we need to focus on trying to increase organic seed in isolated areas and bring the percentage down to the very, very lowest possible. And in that way, be able to increase organic seed production and organic cotton production in general in this gap we see where we, we have too much demand and not enough supply. So it's really, it's quite complex, but I like to talk about it all day long. So please email me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kathleen, I think some of the information that you presented was encouraging because we do have people like Jane Deaver who are actually working on this. So it's moving us forward and it's so important to have this flagged as a need for organic producers because that helps 
propel that research forward. So that's kind of the positive side of things. I feel like a lot of information that we present are can get a little depressing, but there is some really good news as well, which is that there's research getting done to help develop these organic cotton varieties. Um, there's Absolutely. also a question about irradiation. So are all organic products non-irradiated and does that hold for organic cotton? So I can answer that from the organic standards side of things. Basically anything that is certified organic cannot be irradiated. There's no irradiation in organic. Um, but mostly I hear about that for food, um, I haven't heard of any irradiation for cotton, organic or conventional. Kathleen, Angela, any thoughts on that? It, and they, they could be confusing it with fumigation because as I showed in my slides that again, along with irradiation, no fumigants, chemical fumigants are allowed in organic production. There are some inert fumigation like carbon dioxide that can be used to um, kill deal with the insect pests for example but um, if you're talking fumigants no synthetic fumigants are allowed in organic cotton either yep totally agree with kathleen yeah um there's also a question about diversity equity and inclusion in organic cotton so what work is being done to support farmers of color especially in cotton, given the decline in numbers of black farmers. Um, and I'm so glad that you brought this up because the inequity of health impact distributions on communities of color from pesticides is one of the areas where organic can and has made a difference. Um, and we've seen that translate to increased percentages of minor minority owned farms in organic over conventional um, with higher growth rates from year to year. But the number is still really low because our entire food system is built on a history of structural racism, not to mention the deep historical trauma of slavery and cotton plantations. So if we don't act intentionally, if we don't take active steps toward farming equity, those disparities are just going to continue to grow. And I know the Organic Center has this as one of our priorities. Um, we've been collaborating with several organizations who focus on prioritizing diversity and equity in farming. But Angela, I'll let you answer this with some specifics about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the context of GOTS and OCS certification. You know, and unfortunately, organic farming it needed to have some kind of social equity and social compliance side to it from the very beginning and we always struggled with that in that there wasn't um there at the very start for on the farm you know uh farm workers and uh and owners and the land uh ownership was never addressed it was always about like the production methods and so there's um, there's a lot of organizations that try and um, and overlay that like like fair trade for sure, and uh, but we're only seeing that in certain commodity crops and in certain regions. But going forward from the the farm side, which which I know that GOTS would love to tackle, but they don't have the scope for it because it's it's on the organic certification sector. But when we get to the first processing stage, that's where all the social equity side really kicks in for the global organic textile standard criteria and for um, the organic uh, content standard as well under textile exchange. So we're seeing at that point, there's the reg <laughs> the criteria is pretty stiff and it's it's not for everybody because it's it's a lot of stuff to to meet. And if you don't already have a, um, a goal of uh, really inclusion and diversity and um, fair wages and, and um, making sure that there's uh, safety training and and that no none of the workers are are uh, impacted by um, basically you know chemical you know uh, uses that we see in the supply chain for all conventional textiles. Like if you're not toward that already, then it's then it's a steep the steep hill to get up. But for our members, we have been working consistently in certification for a long time. And in the, the Fiber Council, there's a bunch of certifiers that are members. So we're always there like helping everybody along on um, the journey towards certification. But it includes a huge amount of social criteria. All chapter three for GOTS is everything from no discrimination 
all the way through to fair wages to making sure that everybody has um, uh, proper protection equipment when using any of the chemical inputs that are allowed to review of all those chemical inputs. It's, an, it's extensive and I encourage everybody to go to the Global Organic Textile Standard website to really see like the extent because when you're buying a t-shirt and that says got certified at the store it's incredible the amount of work that went into that to make sure that everybody had a fighting chance <laughs> and that they were they were fairly paid and that that they didn't uh, weren't exposed to any uh, noxious chemicals and that the environmental benefit also was there so it's it's a big deal and so when you see that price tag it it's reflected by the extensive work that went into making that product so it's in the farming side that's where we really need to spend a huge amount of time to to just in just support and lift up everybody involved in all all cotton side because it does have a, a horrible legacy and we're we're we wear it and so we you know we take that legacy with us every day and so we need to be able to understand it and accept that that's where it's coming from and then move to change it and so that's where I think supporting black farmers in general for for all crop rotations in the South. Cotton has a place in it too. Doesn't mean that it has to be excluded from everybody's farm because of that legacy, because we're still involved. We're still with it every single day. And we need to we need to acknowledge that and then to support everybody to move forward out of that that past history. So it's really it's very it's complex. We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> yep. There's another question, we're running out of time, but um, there's a question out there, have there been any studies comparing chemical residues on organic versus conventional cotton balls? So I haven't seen any, but there's been a lot of research on organic versus conventional food showing that organic crops outside of cotton, so um, food crops have significantly lower levels of pesticide residues. And my guess would be that that difference would be even more apparent for cotton since conventional cotton uses some of the highest levels of pesticides, um, especially given the defoliation sprays. I feel like that would be a very cool study. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, but I think we are almost out of time. So Kathleen, Angela, I'm gonna give you guys one last chance to bring up anything that you wished we could have covered. I'm also going to give a shout out to um, the Organic Trade Association's fiber page, which there is a link to in the chat box. Check that out. That will answer. I've been seeing a lot of questions about just the basics of what's the difference between certification of organic cotton on the farm versus the processing GOTS certification. Um, what does it mean to be certified organic when it comes to textiles? So if you have questions about that, check out that fiber, fiber page um, that is in the chat. But Angela, Kathleen, any last words? I just wanted to say it'd be really neat if the Organic Trade Association and Organic Center could facilitate a round table perhaps among producers, organic cotton producers and handlers and the industry in as a in whole in the whole because what came out loud and clear in the survey is organic cotton farmers want to produce more, they want to supply more, but they need help. Um, it's a very, very difficult crop to grow, much more difficult than organic grain crops that I work in. So um, you know, we, the industry needs to really get behind them and support all their efforts that they're doing to produce this very difficult crop. Because we love wearing our organic cotton. So um, that would be really neat if we had that round table. Absolutely. And and just stepping off of that as well is that transitional cotton, we need to we need to include that as as the next step to get us on on the journey to uh, organic certification. And it needs to be a part of these supply chains because there, there's just no way that we're going to be able to meet the need out there. And everybody has made the the commitment and the environmental benchmark and the sustainability uh, program around using organic cotton and then to not have it accessible to those supply chains for textile production means we are in a huge disadvantage and <laughs> we absolutely have to step forward and support a transition program toward more use for organic cotton and, and get more people growing it. 
Yeah. And that includes the seed and the whole way through. So brands coming back, you know, um, over from one side on, on the supply chain and seeing what's happening at the field is really imperative that they we make those connections and that we don't stop just a few steps away from, from our own production. We go through the entire thing and we see each aspect of it and it can all use our support for sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for being our panelists. Um, I know that Libby has a few wrap up words. She's gonna talk to you about how you can see some of the past webinars and what's coming up. Um, so Libby, I will hand it back over to you. Thanks, Jessica, so much. Um, as you mentioned, I just shared a link with the audience where you can register for all of our previous Organic Center webinars in the past year. So please dig in there and find how to learn more um, today. And I want to say um, quickly a huge thanks to Angela, Kathleen, and Jessica, each of you for your research and for your work in preparing for today's webinar on behalf of the staff and members of the Organic Trade Association and the Organic Center. We really do appreciate both your time and your dedication. We'd also be remiss to not also extend an additional thanks to the Organic Trade Association's Fiber Council and to all of the donors from the Fiber Council for sponsoring this research study. Um, as a reminder to all of you in attendance, the slides, handouts that we shared, as well as the link to register to view the recording will be emailed out to everyone who registered today within the next uh, two business days. Thanks to all of our Organic Trade Associations and uh, members who are in attendance today and on behalf of the Organic Trade Association and the Organic Center, we hope you join us for future educational opportunities and please have a wonderful day. Thanks. <laughs>